Good morning. Good morning for those who are watching online. And just a special shout out to Monique, who usually plays up here. She had knee surgery this last week, and so she's watching online. So keep Monique in prayer. Uh, so special shout out to you. And then also, if you're at home and you want to participate in the ugly Christmas sweater, you too can send in pictures and be a part of that contest. So thank you for uh, joining in. I see a lot of them out there this morning, and that's just going to continue throughout the season. Tis the season for people to lose their reason. Can I get an amen? amen? There's only 22 days left until Christmas, and Christmas is the holiday with the most traditions. How many of you guys have traditions in your family that you guys do for Christmas? Yeah, we got a lot of hands going up. All right. Clap if you like this tradition, decorating the tree. <laughs> Singing Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. <laughs> Baking sugar cookies. Eating sugar cookies. <laughs> Hiding the bathroom scale because of all the sugar cookies. 52% of Americans work to relive the holidays of their childhood. They try to create that nostalgia. They want that hot pine bling from their past. One of my favorite traditions that my family does is we have a, uh, where we watch Christmas movies throughout the season, but we have a cup, and I'm going to show you a picture, where we place the names of all of our favorite Christmas movies into the cup, and then we just randomly pick one out that night so no one can fight over who gets to choose. It's just randomly chosen for us which one we're going to watch, and that's one of the things that we love doing at the Stanford House. One of those movies, though, is Home Alone. Not part two, part three, part four, point, part six. The only one that matters is part one. That's the only one that goes in the cup, the original. Home Alone is the second highest grossing Christmas movie of all time. It's the second highest grossing of all time. Pop quiz. In Home Alone, where are the McAllisters going on vacation when they leave Kevin behind? Paris. Paris. Good job. I love the confidence. In the movie, the plot, and I'm not going to go through a lot of it because I trust you've seen it at some point in your life. His family leaves, and a little boy named Kevin gets left behind. At first, he loves the idea of his independence. No parental supervision. There's no rules. He can eat ice cream for dinner. He can watch rated R movies. He can shoot his brother's BB gun in the house. But then two grown men try to break in to rob them. And the most unrealistic, most ridiculous thing about that movie is that 40-year-old men fall down and get right back up. That is false. That is the age where you hurt yourself sleeping. There's no way you're getting back up. It doesn't take long for Kevin to feel alone, to miss his family, even his brother Buzz. 55% of Americans feel lonely around the holidays. 55% of Americans feel lonely around the holidays. They say, like Elvis, I'll have a blue, blue Christmas without you. They feel alone because of a breakup, because of divorce, because of the death of a loved one or a new job. I wonder if Mary and Joseph ever felt that way. And we're going to walk through their story. But I wonder if they ever felt alone. Luke chapter 2, verse 4. So Joseph, and everyone say Joseph, also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. When we think about Christmas, we think about things like Frosty the Snowman, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, Mary and Jesus, but we don't think much about Joseph. We don't put a whole lot of thought into Joseph. He's the Christmas prop. prop. You know, you've got to have him for the manger scene, but he's not really the star of the show. Here's a, a picture of the manger scene. That's a manger. Manger scene. It's coming up soon. The manger scene would be incomplete without Joseph. But he's not the star. Think about all the Christmas songs about Mary. How many of you can think of at least one Christmas song about Mary? Mary, did you know? Uh-huh. Oh, little town of Bethlehem, Christ born of Mary. Round young virgin, mother and child, the babe, the son of Mary. Now, how many of you can think of a Joseph song? There's not very many. <laughs> There's not a lot of Christmas songs about Joseph, the original Broseph. Thank you, Jason. We get Dominic the Christmas donkey, but not Joseph. There's some obscure ones, but nothing that Michael Buble, Nat King Cole, or Wham would sing about. 
the Apostle Paul never talks about Joseph in all of his letters. Joseph never gets brought up by, jo- by Paul. Mark and John don't include the Christmas story, so they don't really talk about Joseph much either. We learn about Christmas from Matthew and Luke, and Luke focuses on Mary, and Matthew is the only one who really focuses on Joseph. Joseph is only mentioned 15 times in the New Testament. Only 15 times. While Mary speaks in four different passages, we get four different speeches from Mary, we never hear any words from Joseph. We carpenters try to stick to the four main food groups, candy, candy canes, candy corn, and syrup. We never hear anything from Joseph. We don't know what's going on in his mind. Unfortunately, in most of the material we have about Joseph, he's sleeping. Have you ever noticed that? Most of the material we have on him, he's sleeping. Angels come to him in a dream three times. One is about Mary's womb, and twice it's about the need to vroom. Leave here and head for Egypt. Leave here and head for Israel. But these conversations always happen when he's asleep. What a lazy dude. No, I'm just kidding. It's always when he's resting. He's sleeping. Imagine how alone Joseph must have felt. He didn't have any friends or family who would have believed his story. Imagine someone in your family comes home and is like, hey, guys, my wife's pregnant. It's not mine. It's from the Lord. She's a virgin. You're laughing. So would they. You're not going to believe the story. Notice who is not in the manger scene. Here's another glimpse at it. Notice who is not in the manger scene. None of their friends and family. Think about it. This is the birth of their first child, and they have no friends and family who are there. In fact, Mary hides out with Elizabeth for several months. She goes and hides out with her for several months, probably to escape all the whispered rumors. They were rejected long before they were ever respected. Joseph would lose his reputation as a righteous man in the eyes of the community, but be a righteous man in the eyes of God. He will lose his reputation because of his choice. Sometimes it's our beliefs that make us feel alone. Sometimes it's our beliefs that make us feel alone. You're the only Christian in your friend group or at work or at school. There's not a lot of people in Scripture before Jesus who are called righteous. There's three of them, Noah, Daniel, and Job. Only three people who are called righteous prior to Jesus coming on the scene, but then you also have Joseph. Joseph is called a righteous man, and it doesn't mean a perfect man. It means one who tries to follow God no matter the cost. One mom wrote, Santa saw your Instagram pictures. You're getting clothes and a Bible for Christmas. Anybody know, buddy? (laughs) One of my sons asked if a girl could come over. And I, I have three boys. One of them asked if a girl could come over. And I said, that's fine once an adult is there. And my youngest asked, do they have to have an adult to avoid monkey business? He's 10. So I look at him, I'm like, what do you mean by monkey business? You know, jumping on the couch and throwing bananas at each other? Yes, monkey business. Joseph didn't get into any monkey business. He was a righteous man. He tried to do what God wanted, no matter the cost. Every time God asked Joseph to do something in the story, he obeys it right away. Every time in the Christmas story, God asks Joseph to do something, he obeys it right away, even though it will be very inconvenient for him. It has been said that the best thing you can do for someone who is lonely is not give them help, but ask them for help. Give them an opportunity for purpose. Amen? Thank you. Luke chapter 2, verse 5. He went there to register with Mary who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. The holidays always involve travel. How many of you guys will travel this holiday season? Not very many. Glad. So you guys are all going to be here for the Christmas Eve service. I love it. Perfect. No one's traveling. I think I would rather eat last year's gingerbread house than travel at Christmas time. Can I get an amen? Long lines, screaming kids, the worst weather of the year, TSA, unwrapping your nicely decorated gifts, checking for bombs, strangers singing Christmas songs wrong. How many of you have ever heard someone impulsively try to sing the 12 days of Christmas? 
you quickly find out that everyone knows one line. A partridge in a pear tree. All the rest of it is blah, 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 blah. Partridge in a pear tree. Close to 100 million people traveled last year at Christmas time. 100 million. People took planes and trains and automobiles. The first Christmas involved a lot of travel as well. Mary and Joseph travel, travel from Nazareth to where? Bethlehem. Here's a map. They travel all the way from Nazareth to Bethlehem. That's 90 miles. Nine months pregnant. 90 miles, nine months pregnant. They don't have an one horse open sleigh to get them there. Traveling was dangerous. People often traveled in a caravan or a large group because there were thieves and wild animals. But it looked like they traveled alone. Willing to risk all that in order to get to where God was calling them to go. Sometimes we feel alone because family and friends are in another part of the country or world. Sometimes we feel alone because family and friends are in another part of the world. When I was growing up, Christmas Eve always started at my grandparents' house. It was the kickoff to Christmas. It was the official countdown to Christmas morning. There was always lots of presents under the tree. Grandpa would always tell us a funny story, such as, a gingerbread man went to the doctors complaining of a sore knee. The doctor asked him, have you tried icing it? <laughs> like that. Grandpa, he would do it. Or, what did Adam say the day before Christmas? It's Christmas, Eve. <laughs> now you're going to feel real bad for not clapping hard because he's dead. <laughs> Want to clap again? I'm just kidding. He is actually dead, but he would, his, his sarcasm was the same as mine. That's where I got it from. A couple of years ago, my grandpa passed away, and my grandma moves to Texas, same year. Going to their house was no longer an option. I mean, I could still show up, but the new owners probably wouldn't be as welcoming. Fair. Now, I'm surrounded by family and friends. I have a big family. But those first couple of Christmases without them didn't feel like Christmas. Anyone know what I mean? And when that family member's gone, whether they're in another part of the world or they've passed away, all of a sudden you can feel so alone even though you're surrounded by other people. Did you know that the dangers of feeling lonely are equal to smoking 15 cigarettes a day or eating one spoonful of figgy pudding? It's the same. Luke chapter 2, verse 6 through 7. Did you say I'm terrible? I am. Luke chapter 2, verse 6 through 7. How many of you guys want Pastor Jason back? <laughs> Got a couple of hands. All right. <laughs> While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she, gave him, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. The phrase swaddling clothes and manger is repeated three times in the nativity story. It's repeated three times, which means it's super important. It's supposed to be a sign. So what's the big deal about swaddling clothes and a manger? Swaddling clothes is something almost every baby was wrapped in in the first century. It was just strips of cloth that was used to keep them snug and to keep them warm, a little like a baby Bjorn. You know, just keep them feeling snug. It's the manger that's unique. So while almost every baby would have had the swaddling clothes, the manger is what's unique. A manger was a feeding box for animals. That's a manger. So we think of this whole setup as the manger. In reality, it's the box that was used to feed animals. That's the actual manger. Could you imagine giving birth to your first kid and their first crib is an animal's food bowl? Think about it. Now, if it's your third kid, no problem. But the first one... They deserve the best. Can I get an amen? This must have been traumatic for Mary. Most people go out of their way for the best hospital possible. They want to give their newborn baby the best option possible. I drove all the way from Zion to Highland Park, passing up lots of hospitals for my first son. Now that he's an adult, I'm still waiting to see if it was worth it. He watches. Jesus gets a food box. 
The moment we put on Christmas cards, ornaments, and lawn decorations was much less serene than the pictures that we see. Think about it. This was probably not what Mary anticipated when the angel Gabriel showed up nine months earlier and announced God's lofty promises about Jesus. And let's read that promise. So imagine, this is what's in the back of her mind that the angel has predicted, and then where they end up. Luke chapter 1, verse 31 through 33. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him, everyone say it, Jesus. He will be what? Great, and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the what? Throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants, what? Forever. His kingdom will never end. Think about that. Think about those promises. While most parents tend to exaggerate about how great their kids are, this is an angel describing how great Jesus is going to be. This isn't just Mary's idea. This is the angels coming and saying, this is what your son is going to be. Now, what's going on in her head then when she gives birth and has to place him in a food bowl? Think about it. If the angel came and gave these promises to you, you would not expect that to be the path to the promises. He will be a king. He will sit on David's throne. He will be the son of the most high. His kingdom will last forever. Notice there's no mention of a manger or a cross. Now, how does Mary reconcile God's promise with him sitting on a throne with his first crib being a food bowl? Bethlehem is only 30 miles from where they're at right now. Bethlehem is only 30 miles from Jerusalem. They are close to the throne, close to King Herod's massive temple, yet so humbly far away. Do you ever feel far away from the promises of God? Do you ever feel like God has promised you something, and it just seems like it's never going to happen? That the path that your life has taken is so far away from what you feel like he has said to you. While we get excited about God's promises, we rarely get excited about God's process and God's plan. God's promise came true, but it came in a way that no one would have imagined. And the same thing is true in our own lives. Sometimes you feel alone because you don't think anyone else understands what you're going through. Sometimes you feel alone because you don't think anyone else understands what you're going through. There were no support groups for virgins giving birth to the Son of God in the first century. Mary was on her own. There are times that the path that God takes you, there is no one else that's going to completely understand what you're experiencing and what you're going through. Can I get an amen? This holiday season, we will be surrounded by lonely people. People who are possibly singing, last Christmas, I gave you my heart, but the very next day, you gave it away. Robin Williams said this, and I think this is fantastic. He says, I used to think that the worst thing that, you, that could happen to you was to end up alone. But even worse than that is to be surrounded by people who make you feel alone. Woo! Sometimes those comedians can make some really good points. Some of you know that feeling. You've sat in church. You've been surrounded by people. But you have felt utterly alone. You've sat around with your family at the Christmas table, and you have felt utterly alone. God has given you a calling and a mission where you have felt utterly alone. I want to share a few words of encouragement for the lonely. Number one, being lonely and alone are not the same thing. Being lonely and alone are not the same thing. This Christmas, you will see thousands of nativities on cards, in yards, on trees, and stages, When my kids were young, I would put a manger up on the tree, and I would hide it somewhere, and they'd have to find it before we could open presents, just like the wise men had to find the nativity. They were huge fans. By huge fans, I mean they did not like it. So just because you're a pastor doesn't mean you have to always preach, Dad. Save it for Sundays. You will see Mary and Joseph, wise men, animals, angels, stars, and a baby Jesus, but one person you won't see in that nativity, someone we don't always think about, is God the Father. For some, he's the stranger in the manger. 
God the Father. He's orchestrated this whole thing. These people would have never met without God's gentle leading. A census gets Mary and Joseph there. A choir of angels gets the shepherds there. A star gets the wise men there. Notice God using all these different things to get them to that moment, to get them to that scene. Seven years before any of this have happened, 700 years before any of it happens, Isaiah writes these words. For a child is born, a son is given, and the government will rest on his shoulders. These will be his royal titles, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. When we feel alone, we need to remember that God is always there. When we feel alone, God is always there. He's behind the scenes. He's orchestrating our path and our life. Mandy Hill once said, A season of loneliness and isolation is when the caterpillar gets its wings. Remember that the next time you feel alone. God uses that to grow you, to transform you. God promises in Psalm 68.5 to be a father to the fatherless a defender of widows. God has a heart for those who feel alone. If you are feeling lonely, know that God wants to be there for you. When my oldest was little, we had a birthday party and we had a, a Nerf war. It was just an excuse for the dads to shoot their kids with Nerf darts. And all of his friends from school, they were invited and they came out to be a part of this extravaganza. And a friend of ours brought a little boy named Stephen. He was a part of a program. It wasn't foster care, but it was a little bit like foster care. And he was part of this family, so he came to this party. And when he showed up, he ran up. And, and remember, he, he doesn't know any other kids who are there. He runs up to this little boy and starts hugging him. And this little boy was also a part of a program like the foster care system. My wife's aunt or aunt was taking care of him, and our friend and aunt, they live hours away from each other. Keep that in mind. So we asked this little boy, who are you hugging? And to our surprise, he said, this is my little brother. They hadn't seen each other for a couple of weeks. These two families didn't know one another. God orchestrated this moment because he has a heart for the orphans to bring them together, to be reunited. God, scripture talks about God's heart for orphans dozens of times, that he is a father to the fatherless. Feeling lonely is not the same thing as being alone. God is with you. In fact, that's what Emmanuel means, God with us. Christmas means that you are never alone. God with us. Number two, you are a part of a much bigger story and family than you realize. You are a part of a much bigger family and story than you realize. Christmas doesn't start with twas the night before Christmas and all through the house. Christmas doesn't even start with a Christmas tree. It starts with a family tree. One of the first things we learn about Joseph is his genealogy. How many of you get excited about the genealogy in the Bible? Woo! Next year we're going to do a series on the genealogy. No, we're not. Just, just kidding. Most people skip these first 17 verses. They just go right to the virgin birth. Like, I ain't got time for that. I have never heard them read during a Christmas play. Can you imagine a bunch of little six-year-olds out there trying to read through the names? 41 obscure names. Sheltiel begat Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel begat Blitzen. Blitzen begat Prancer and Vixen. You know they'd mess it up. Before anyone can sing away in a manger, we get this family tree. Matthew chapter 1, verse 15 through 16. Elihud, the father of Eleazar. Eleazar, the father of Mathan. Mathan, the father of Jacob. And Jacob, the father of Joseph. The husband of Mary. And Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. Notice it doesn't say Joseph was the father of Jesus. Something intentional is happening here. In grade school, we all learn about patterns. If you have gingerbread cookie and eggnog. Gingerbread cookie and eggnog. Gingerbread cookie and then blank. What do you expect the next thing to be? Puking. It's too much eggnog. That's what would happen. But we look for patterns. 
And if a person is reading through Matthew and they see 41 times where it says so-and-so was the father of so-and-so, you expect the pattern to continue, but Jesus breaks the pattern. When we get to Jesus, all of a sudden the pattern changes. When we feel alone, we need to remember that we are part of a much larger story and family than we realize. Mary and Joseph might have felt alone on that night that Jesus was born, but they were a part of a story that went all the way back to Abraham. They were a part of a story and family much bigger than they realized, and they would touch the lives of billions of people that they would never meet this side of eternity in the future because of that moment. Just because you feel lonely today does not mean you will always feel alone. You are a part of a bigger family and a bigger story than you realize. Number three, we all have the ability to help others feel a little less lonely this holiday season. Fill in the blank. Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Let's do it for real this time. Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Oh, so beautiful. Each of you were handed a red nose on the way in. If you didn't get one, grab one on your way out. They are to be a reminder to you of the people who feel alone this holiday season. Think about Rudolph. He was lonely because he felt different. They wouldn't allow him to play in the reindeer games. I don't know what the reindeer games are. I don't know if they're like Olympics, what it actually looks like, but we know he wasn't allowed to participate because of his what? Shiny red nose. But it only took one person to make Rudolph feel included. And who was that? Santa. One day Santa comes along, says, Rudolph, with your nose so bright, why don't you guide my sleigh tonight? And then we find out how fickle reindeer really are because all of a sudden they're like, you're our best friend. <laughs> that is humanity. <laughs> oh, we can't stand you. Oh, you're so amazing. That's why I like God's opinion, not yours. But for the people at work and school in your neighborhood, you just might be the difference to make them feel included, to make them feel loved, to make them feel like they're a part of something. How many of you have ever accidentally texted the wrong person? Who hasn't? I saw a funny response to a wrong text a couple years ago. A girl texted a picture of her and her newborn baby. It was cute, but the person responded because they sent it to the wrong person, and they wrote, I just met you. This is crazy. You have the wrong number. I don't know that baby. <laughs> For most of the people surrounding Bethlehem, they did not understand the significance of what just happened. For most of the people on planet Earth, they had no idea what Jesus' birth really meant. They didn't know that the King of Kings was just born, that the baby crying was the Lion of Judah, that the carpenter's son was the Alpha and the Omega, that the baby lying in a manger was the one who made the molecules for that manger to be possible. For 99% of the planet, the day went unnoticed. It's not like the people woke up on December 26th and said, you know what? Every day before this felt like B.C. <laughs> I love how slowly that sunk in. <laughs> Next year, let's deck the halls and shop the malls. Most people wouldn't take the five-mile trip to go visit the newborn babe. Who were the first people to show up for baby Jesus? Shepherds. Stinking, non-gift-giving shepherds. <laughs> the wise men don't show up for a couple years. It's shepherds. But they would have told Mary and Joseph about the angels that they had seen and what the angels had said, and they would have made Mary and Joseph feel a little less alone because someone else had heard the message and knew what that baby meant and represented. What can you do this holiday season to make the people around you feel a little less lonely? Rather than avoid people like a mistletoe at an office party, maybe smile and say Merry Christmas. Maybe actually make eye contact with the people around you. Send someone a Christmas card that you actually hand write a note on. Give the waiter or waitress a little extra. Bake someone a fruitcake. <laughs> I 
but don't give it to me. (laughs) Go with us Christmas caroling. Say it's what I've always wanted after every gift, not where's the gift receipt. Did you know that one-third of Christians never practice hospitality? One-third of Christians never have a person to their home that is not a family member. That's a sin. Because Scripture says that we are to practice hospitality. Read the New Testament. I won't even try to convince you. Just read the New Testament and then come back to me and tell me why you don't do it. All right? They never have anyone but family members to their house. My wife and I were at Hobby Lobby. I'm going to wrap up here. And where's Tim can come back up. My wife and I were at Hobby Lobby, uh, I think it was last year. She was looking for some yarn, and there was a little old lady in the aisle who had really bad B.O. And it's important to the story. I'm sorry. I find that the older I get, the more sensitive my nose is. Anybody with me? Like The older I get, the more sensitive my nose is. So I was trying to stay away from her, but then she starts talking to my wife. Strangers love talking to my wife. We can't go somewhere without someone wanting to talk to my wife. I was thankful I put cologne on my hands. When I put cologne on, I always spray my hands. So I was like sniffing the cologne in my hand while I'm trying to engage because I'm trying to be nice. I'm trying to be polite. Come to find out she was shopping for yarn. She knits hats for cancer patients. She had cancer three times. It was now cancer-free for 12 years. She figures if God helped her, she can help others. So she has knitted 1,850 hats. In that moment, I felt like the Grinch when his heart was two sizes too small. I was like, how dare I act that way towards this poor little old lady who is literally an angel walking around on earth helping out other people. Never judge a book by its smell. Now, I'm being funny, but how many times have we avoided someone because they were different, because they were weird, because they weren't like us, they weren't a part of our natural friend circle, and we are sinning? God wanted to use us to make that person feel a little less alone, to be Emmanuel, God with us. As the church, we are Christ's body, are we not? Did Christ avoid the homeless? Did Christ avoid the marginalized? Did Christ avoid people who didn't wear deodorant? No, because they didn't have deodorant at that point. We need to be open to go where Christ goes, and that's going to be places that make us uncomfortable. Amen? It's going to make us uncomfortable but it's where we need to go. This Christmas, we are collecting gift cards to help out foster kids. And I wrote this down, and I I think this is good. Maybe they don't believe in Christmas, but they need to know that Christmas believes in them. And they are the reason why Christ came. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much that in spite of my brokenness and my sarcasm and my less than Christ-likeness, that you still work through me. And God, that you are going around and you're looking for people to tap on the shoulder and say, hey, I want to use you in spite of you. There are people out there who need to know that they are not alone. God, there are people who are on the brink of wanting to end their life, that all it would take is someone coming in and loving them. And I pray that as the church, we would be those kinds of people. That rather than being so focused on all of the tinsel and all the bright and shiny things, that we can see the brokenness that's all around us and that we could be your hands and your feet in your name. Amen.